still stuck on the traffic on the A303, but they will no doubtless join us in due course. Um, just let me first introduce myself. I'm Peter Beatty. I'm the um, executive chairman, or as it says in Anthony's details, with the, which he circulated, the executive chair of the Sir Edward Heath Charitable Foundation. It makes me feel like one of those old black leather armchairs, you know, the sort they use in Mastermind. But anyway, um, it's my pleasant duty on behalf of the Sir Edward Heath Charitable Foundation to welcome you here all today um, to the seventh annual Edward Heath Lecture. Um, we're very grateful to you all for coming, but I'd like in particular to um, welcome our distinguished guests and speakers. I'm especially pleased that our honorary chairman, uh, Lord McGregor of Pullham Market and Lady McGregor have been able to join us today. And also that um, one of our past lecturers, the Right Honourable the Lord Butler and Lady Butler, Lord Butler was the fourth Edward Heath lecturer a few years ago. And um, an annual and particular pleasure is to welcome one of the Foundation's oldest friends and indeed its patron, just as she was perhaps one of Ted Heath's closest friends, if not the closest, the Honourable Mrs. Sarah Morrison, who will of course be giving the vote of thanks at the end. Um, before I do um, welcome the speakers, I perhaps could just say a few words of the, about the Sir Edward Heath Charitable Foundation and Arundel's. Of course, all of you will have an opportunity and we welcome you most warmly to visit um, Arundel's after the proceedings this afternoon. We continue to make steady progress. We've had a tough time over the last decade or more since we opened, um, we opened the house to the public, but we make steady progress. Of course, in common with everybody in Salisbury, we face the depredations of Novichok, and in common with the whole country, we suffered from COVID. But we're hoping that we're now beginning to emerge onto the um, sunlit uplands. We, in Salisbury itself and at Arundel's, we continue to um, organize a regular program of activities. We have regular speak speaker meetings, which are well attended. We also have opera and drama in the garden, and we hold music events both in the garden and the house. And, of course, we don't confine our activities merely to Arundel's and its gardens. We also have um, events in the Medieval Hall and in the Guild Hall. And um, we're delighted that with the consent of the Dean and Chapter that we're able to use this wonderful um, cathedral today. Um, one particular series of events that we've launched in order to broaden our reach are the Edward Heath University Lectures in which we um, collaborate with a, uh, a series of universities around the country. We've already held events at uh, Nottingham University, at which Michael Heseltine spoke, at Newcastle University, and I'm delighted that uh, Dr. Martin Barr of the university is with us today, at which uh, Chris Patton spoke. Um, our event in, um, our lecture in Edinburgh in the university lecture series was um, given by Malcolm Rifkind at the Playfair Library at Edinburgh University. And the next event will be at King's College London, where um, what Anthony calls the Ken and Heza show will take place. That is, um, Heza will give the lecture and um, the Lord Clerk of Nottingham will be in the chair and make his, uh, his contributions. Anyway, enough of the foundation. Um, we are absolutely delighted to have such a glittering array of um, speakers today. Um, in a sense, it's impossible to introduce them. As I walked across from my hotel to Arundel's this morning, in the cathedral and the early morning light was looking beautiful, and I thought, there is one national treasure. Now, of course, this afternoon, we have four national treasures with us that have helped to fill this place with, um, with people. And on your behalf, I'd, um, I'd like, like to welcome them. 
First of all, Carolyn Quinn. I note that Carolyn is, um, is a Kentish lady. And I advise rather than a lady of Kent. Because I remember when I was Ted Heath's private secretary many years ago that um, one of his favourite lines when he was speaking in London or the South East was to say, I was born a man of Kent, but I became a Kentishman by adoption. So he'd be particularly pleased that a, uh, a Kentish lady, we used to call them a maid of Kent, but I think that's because, or Kentish maid, but I think that's probably become inappropriate nowadays. Um, of course, Carolyn um, has been a feature of our national political and intellectual life for decades now. Um, she, many of us used to wake up to the, uh, uh, to the PM program. Uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I live in China, or I did until very recently, so my, my sense of time is sometimes a bit out. Wake up to um, the Today programme, and we also saw her on, the, um, um, on, on PM and the Week at Westminster and, and many other political programmes. She, she has unparalleled experience of our political life over the last few decades, and a, a distinguished career at the BBC from which she retired and I'm delighted that she's agreed to join us today. So, Carolyn, thank you very much indeed. Lord Dobbs, of course, ha one can't introduce him, particularly in Salisbury, since as the Baron Dobbs of Wiley, he chose to make this, uh, this area his home. And uh, we all know him as a distinguished writer, but also a distinguished politician and an advisor to Margaret Thatcher in the late 1970s and through the 1980s. So we're pleased also to have the benefit of his experience. Um, as to David Dimbleby and, and Giles Brandworth, they really are household names, and I think it's, um, it's really impossible for me to introduce them. Um, we all know a great deal about them, We've all admired them for years for their various activities, political commentary, election, broadcast, question time, you name it. So suffice it to say, they are most welcome, and on your behalf, I welcome them and thank them for coming today. Um, finally, in a moment, I will hand over to the Dean, who will welcome us to this great cathedral, which we're privileged to be able to use. Um, but uh, before doing so, I'd like to thank him and his staff for all their assistance in setting up the event. And I would also like to thank our magnificent staff, volunteers and trustees in Arundel's for all that they've done to make this possible. Especially, of course, um, Anthony Teasdale, one of my fellow trustees, who's masterminded this, and uh, Ivan Smith, um, who is the manager at Arundel's, who holds the whole thing together. Um, also, of course, um, Gordon, who always plays a major role with the, uh, with the logistics. So finally, may I hand over to uh, Nick Papadopoulos, the Dean of Salisbury, and thank him once more for allowing us to use his wonderful cathedral. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much, and welcome, all of you, uh, welcome to Salisbury Cathedral, to a place uh, beloved of Sir Edward Heath. It's a great pleasure for those of us who have the privilege of living and working and worshipping here day by day to host this annual event. It's one to which we look forward and we enjoy working in collaboration with our neighbours in the close, in the foundation and at Arundel's. So thank you and a warm welcome to you all. One parish notice, uh, in the event of our needing to uh, leave the building sooner than we expect, please follow the direction of our stewards who are unmistakable in their white sashes. As I have the floor for a moment, um, I'd invite you while you're here to enjoy the artwork that fills the building at the moment. It's an exhibition uh, entitled To Be Free, a curated collection 
of a number of pieces from world-renowned artists. It'll be running here until September, and over the course of the summer there are two lectures coming up connected to the exhibition which may be of interest to some of you. On the 13th of July, uh, we'll welcome Shami Chakrabarti to speak. And then on the 9th of August, uh, Brenda Hale, Baroness Hale, uh, to speak as well to the themes suggested by the exhibition. All the details on the Cathedral website. It'll be very good to see all or any of you at either of those. Lectures, art, but of course this is, above all, a house of prayer. And so before I hand over to our panel, I'll invite you to be still for a moment and join as you're able in what I will offer on our behalf. Almighty God, who hast given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee to bless us with honourable industry, sound learning, and unwavering faith. Defend our liberties, preserve our unity, endue with wisdom and grace all those to whom is entrusted the authority of government, and ever lead us in the paths of righteousness and peace to the honour and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Giles Brandreth. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you right at the back hear me? Yes? Wave if you can hear me. Wave any... Oh, look at that! Because we were a little bit anxious up here. The acoustic is unusual in that um, we don't think you can, we can't hear each other, but we hope that you can, and clearly you can. Good afternoon. My name is indeed Giles Brandreth. If you're wondering why I am here this afternoon, then already we have something in common. Uh, <laughs> I I'm delighted to be here, honoured to be here. I first met Edward Heath when I was a student at Oxford University in the 1960s. I got to work with him on the European campaign to do with the referendum in the 1970s. And in the 1990s, when I was in the government whip's office, I was given the challenging task of uh, persuading him to vote for the government of the day. Uh, this was, at times, really quite challenging, but he usually delivered the goods. Yes, I have turned up. Uh, my wife and I were always thrilled to come to Arundel's, uh, a beautiful house, which he loved and wanted to share with all of us and with people from across the world. Uh, I, I remember so vividly going there. Always, I, I wanted to pretend that I had a, liked cigars after lunch because he would always say at the end of lunch, do you want a cigar? Fidel gave me these. Whoa. Um, and I, he was very fond of his uh, association with Fidel Castro. He was an interesting man in many ways. He also was very proud of the orchids in the garden. As he also said, Fidel gave me these. But Fidel used to send him cigars every Christmas. I hope today before you leave, you will spend a moment maybe just standing by the memorial stone where we remember him. Because we are very privileged to be here this afternoon in this wonderful building. We're in one of the, the great rooms of Europe and we are here this afternoon. And we're here remembering a remarkable individual who was a serious man, a proper statesman, with views that were born out of experience in the Second World War, and he lived them to the last. And in this world where perhaps some of us have reservations about politicians around the world, it's good to think back to somebody like Ted Heath, with whom you may have agreed or disagreed, but he was a real man of conviction who carried through what he believed in to the last. So a good man worth celebrating and a beautiful house worth preserving and visiting year round. So thank you for supporting Arundel's and the Edward Heath Charitable Foundation. Coming up, we will have 
after we have had our principal lecturer speak to us, we have two wonderful people, Michael Dobbs, who is an old friend of mine, as you've heard, worked for Margaret Thatcher, John Major, House of Cards, I mean, you know, he, he wrote the story of our times in that. I particularly like his novels about Winston Churchill. And Carolyn Quinn, PM, the Today Programme, and of course, the Westminster Hour, uh, which I've listened to since she began in it, and I was so sad when she decided, was it only earlier this year, to retire from it. But she has met and interviewed so many politicians. Uh, Michael has worked with so many politicians. I have known so many politicians. But we come now to our star attraction. And I don't think you may appreciate how unusual this is that David Dimbleby has been persuaded to give his time to us this afternoon. Because for such a public figure, he is a curiously private person. You will know, and I'm particularly conscious of his family heritage, because I've recently completed a biography of the late Queen Elizabeth II, and so I've been thinking a lot this coronation, about the 1953 coronation, when most of us in this room, who are of that vintage, were introduced to David's father, Richard Dimbleby, and his voice because of that coronation. Uh, Rick David, I think, was the first to report, I think he first appeared on the BBC in the 1950s in a, a program called Passport. Do you remember that? Long before that. Was it? Oh, before? Oh, well, he's, I first appeared when I was 11 years old. Well. I know. Oh, my gosh. A terrible fate. That is a terrible fate. I won't tell you. Well, I will. Can I tell them what the year that would have been? That would have been about 1949. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. There we are. Uh, but he became the anchor for the general elections. He was a reporter in 1964, that general election. Anchor for general elections from 1979 onwards. When he stopped being the anchor, I stopped following general elections. And you'll see the consequences. Um, <laughs> In relation to Ted, it's significant too that he was the person who um, handled the program on the 23rd and 24th of June, 2016, that gave us the results of that referendum. Since when uh, Ted has been spinning in his grave and making regular uh, appearances here, I imagine, at night with fireworks. But we are really honored to have with us somebody who has come from a lineage of broadcasters but is himself one of the great broadcasters of our time, who has interviewed literally every leading politician of most of our lifetimes. I'm excited, I'm delighted, I'm honored to welcome to the podium, David Dimbleby. Giles, thank you very much. Dean, thank you very much. I have to say, I find um, speaking here in a cathedral daunting in many ways, because what I'll be talking about is the profane side of politics. Um, I remember we once took question time to Liverpool Cathedral, and the first question was about prostitution. And I remember thinking, I can't talk about this in this cathedral. And I feel the same about being here today. The, the, the place itself, so splendid, so beautiful. We're going to discuss the humdrum business of interviewing politicians. I, I had my first political interview actually with Ted Heath. I was 24 years old, and it was the moment when Ted Heath was negotiating under Harold Macmillan's government with the entry of Britain into the European community, after which de Gaulle gave his veto. And it was the first political interview I'd ever done, and I was absolutely terrified. And it was about a, a very arcane subject, which was Canadian wheat. Now, Ted Heath was an expert on all these things, as you can imagine, and the negotiation was centered on how much Canadian wheat we should bring in to the UK if we joined the common market, as against using French wheat. French wheat makes delicious baguette. Canadian wheat makes hard bread that the British were thought to like. And that's what I had to interview him about. 
I worked away at the detail of it, and then the day came for the interview, and I remember being very nervous, and I, I took some advice, perhaps unwisely, that somebody had once said to me, which is, if ever you have to talk to a very important person, a very powerful person that you're nervous of, then just imagine them naked. So I go into the studio, and I conduct this interview with Ted Heath, which goes passably well, except for, in my head, he's standing there naked in front of me. And I remember, for several weeks afterwards, I used to have these terrible nightmares <laughs> recurring. And I, then, I did then meet him a bit afterwards. I met him in the two election defeats. Uh, I was at, at his count in, September, in October and the spring of 1974. And I tried to make small talk to him about boats, and that didn't work, because he wasn't a man for small talk. And um, I, I saw him there, and the very last time I saw him, oddly, was at Cowes, at the regatta at Cowes, when um, we were, I was in a little tiny sailing boat coming up to the finishing line, and behind us I heard a voice shout, can we come through? And I looked up, and it was Ted Heath, in morning cloud, roaring past us to the finishing line. But I had, uh, I had a lunch with him at Arundel's, that I remember, like uh, Giles does, with, um, I think, Murray Pariah was there, the pianist. It was a great moment. Anyway, I want to talk about political interviewing, and um, I've called this not the answers, you fool, the questions. It was at a Blackpool party conference that Robin Day, who used to sit beside me at conference doing commentary, disappeared to interview the Home Secretary of the day and came back uh, and we'd seen it on a monitor. And he came back, sat down beside me, lit his cigar as ever, and turned and said, what did you think of that? And I said, well, I didn't think it was very interesting. He didn't seem to say anything new. Not the answers, you fool, the questions. <laughs> and Robin had a right to talk about political interviewing because he actually effectively invented political interviewing as we know it. Before then, prime ministers and senior politicians were treated with great respect. They spoke off the record to particular correspondence that they favored, perhaps which led to Louis Heron, the Times journalist, saying, you know, whenever anybody speaks to me, a senior politician, in confidence, I think to myself, why is this lying bastard lying to me? <laughs> Words attributed to Jeremy Paxman, but actually they came from Louis Heron. But in 1958, Robin Day conducted the first serious interview with Harold Macmillan, in which he asked him whether he was happy with the performance of his foreign secretary. Selwyn Lloyd, and uh, Macmillan said, well, I, yes, I, I mean, if I wasn't happy, I would have asked him to leave. And Robin went on, and would you like to leave? And Macmillan said, well, I, I would, all of us would like to lay down this heavy burden, blustering his way through. But it was, funnily, the first time a politician had been spoken to in that way. They'd been treated with reverence up until then. And the newspapers at the time spotted this. The Daily Express said it was the most vigorous cross-examination the Prime Minister has ever been subjected to in public. And the Manchester Guardian, as it was, Macmillan exposed himself to a process some Prime Ministers of the past, and perhaps all, would have deemed impertinent. Uh, Years later, when Macmillan was in his 90s, I happened to be at a reception where he was, and I was sitting at a chair beside him, and I said, you know, what did he make of political interviewing? What did he make of Robin Day? And he went, he just shook his head and said, never, never had any trouble from him. <laughs> so, the issue that Robin was talking about, and that he was the prime mover in creating, is the business not of the answers you get from politicians, but of the questions you put to politicians. And if you can imagine a big political interview, a set-piece interview with a, a prime minister, 
Uh, the process begins long before with research into everything they've said, but then with an extraordinary theatrical performance where with the producer and the interviewer and maybe researchers, you play out, you try out what questions will work. What would happen if I say this? What would happen if I say that? And I had my first rather unfortunate experience with this with Robin Day and we were going to interview Harold Wilson way in the mid 60s and we sat around chewing the card what should I say and Robin said why don't you ask him whether he passes too many laws because people seem to think that and I thought oh that's a good question so when my turn came to ask a question I said um, many people think that you pass too many laws and the Duke of Edinburgh says that you almost need a license now to breathe in this country. I thought that was a corker of a question. <laughs> Harold Wilson said, hmm, funny that, puffing on his pipe. People always ask me to introduce more laws, not least members of Her Majesty's opposition. Death of interviewer. <laughs> I actually, I always thought afterwards that it was Robin Day who had planted this on me because he was a very, nothing if not an ambitious and elbowing politician. We came on to, well, I did interview Harold Wilson later. I did have actually a Ted Heath moment with Harold Wilson when I asked him about his earnings from his memoirs and he got in a furious, furious temper and his repost was curious. He said, did you ask, he didn't name him, did you ask him how he paid for his yacht? Anyway, the, the choice of the choice of questions, and this is my point really, is itself, of course, a political decision. In effect, you're setting an agenda. That's why the questions that are asked are so important. And that's why for a time, I think, senior politicians, Ted Heath, Harry Wilson, Margaret Thatcher, John Major, would agree to a long-term, long-form, interview because they were genuinely passionately interested in the policies they were putting forward and there were different techniques for, for interviewing which emerged I mean Robin was very loyally he'd been trained as a lawyer and he was not actually interested in policy as such he wanted to see if a politician had thought logically through what they were doing and would use what was in Hansard and things to throw at them and say, well, you said this on last month, why are you saying the other now? And um, Brian Walden, who was the other person in my view, who at this time set the standard of political interviewing and was very respected by politicians who he interviewed, uh, he used to use a, a sort of mathematical approach. He made a chart in the Savoy Hotel where he used to stay on the eve of his Sunday broadcast. And you make a very complicated chart with lines saying, if she says this, go there. And if she says that, go there. How he ever did it, I don't know. But anyway, that was his technique, a very kind of analytical one. He, he used to say, I, I understand politicians, but I detest ambiguity. It's always my instinct to ask people exactly what they mean. And he did have a famous interview with Mrs. Thatcher. They were, they were a sort of admiration, little admiration society for a long time. In fact, he wrote one of her speeches for the Tory party conference. But when she was heading towards the exit and uh, was about to fight, uh, fight off a, a challenge to her leadership, he said to her, you come over as someone who one of your backbenchers said is, and these were the words, slightly off her trolley authoritarian, domineering, refusing to listen to anyone else. Why? And Mrs. Thatcher rather limply, I think, said, well, if anyone's coming over as domineering in this interview, it's you, Rob, um, um, Brian. And she wrote in her memoirs, the day was the most aggressive interviewer, and Walden was the most probing. But for my money, they set the gold standard. Um, she, she was a difficult person. I interviewed her many times, Panorama and other places. Uh, my first interview actually with her was weird. She went to Washington uh, when she'd just been made leader of the Tory party. 
uh, with Gordon Rees, who was her PR man. And um, Gordon Rees was very keen that she should be seen as a powerful, the first, you know, potentially the first woman prime minister, as a woman of power. So he wanted her to be interviewed in front of the White House. So she'd be here and the White House would be behind her. So we went to Lafayette Park, which was where we were to do the interview, and there was a bench which she could sit on, which was fine. The question was, how do we get the eye line right between me and her? Because obviously she can't talk sideways to me on the bench that way or that way, because then she hasn't got the White House behind her. So she, um, we, we, we sort of paused the moment, and I saw a big plastic dustbin in Lafayette Park, and I put it down there, and I sat facing her, the White House there. And that looked fine, and I began the interview, and as I began the interview, the dustbin slowly <laughs> subsided. Gordon Rees said, we've only got another five minutes. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I thought, there's only one thing to do. Oh. And I interviewed her <laughs> on my knees to get the eye line right, which would have been fine, which would have been fine except that a passing British tourist took a photograph <laughs> of the BBC on its knees in front of Mrs. Thatcher and sent it to number 10 Downing Street. I think she held it over me ever since. I did have a, I had an odd moment with her. I did, as I say, interview her a lot. Uh, she very rarely slipped up. It's very difficult if you're a politician not to slip up, not to say something that just doesn't work. Because, you know, you're attuned to it. And she worked very hard. She always used to say it was very testing doing an interview, and she'd prepare for it very carefully. But I remember once at the, the eve of the 1987 election, and I had to do an interview on the last day, which we did all party leaders on the last day. And we would, it was during a period when Michael Heseltine, for instance, was talking publicly about how, or semi-publicly, about how Thatcher didn't really care about unemployment. And so this had to be one of my questions. So I said to her, um, I said to her something like, people feel you don't care. And she gave an extraordinary reply. She said, if people just drool and drivel that they care, I turn around and say, what do you actually do? And so I picked up on this and I said, drool and drivel, is that what you think caring amounts to? And astonishingly, she pulled back and said, no, I'm sorry I used those words. Uh, uh, and, and apologized and tried to back off. And at the end of the interview, uh, I said, well, you know, conventional question, are there any lessons you've learned? And to my huge embarrassment, she said, well, perhaps you've taught me one today. It's not enough to do. You have to talk about caring. Now that in interviewing terms is what you call a gotcha moment. You know, it's a really, it was a really insight into her thinking, into her ability to pull back from something that she felt had gone wrong that would be headlines as it was the next day. And, and a sort of capacity, really, to, to keep thinking right through, which she, she always did in her interviews. Even when, I remember one interview where she reinvented the National Health Service to the total consternation of her staff, who came to me afterwards and said, what was it she said, what was it she said? I said, she said she's going to reorganize the NHS. Oh my God, they said, oh, and went off to find out what it was she really wanted. Anyway, that kind of interview, that kind of set piece interview is what I think of, uh, and maybe I would, as the sort of best possible way of conducting political interviews. Um, time, not rushed, penetrating, thoughtful, ideally on both sides, carefully worked out, um, being careful about the agenda, because the, as I say, the agenda you choose in a way is you as an interviewer saying what you think is important, and you have no right to do that. What you're trying to do is to judge what's important to the people watching, to the public, 
and indeed your only, your only right to ask the questions you ask and to push for the answers is because you are speaking on behalf of the public. You're speaking on behalf of the person watching television. That gives you the courage to do it. That's why I was able in the end to stop thinking of every prime minister as naked when I interviewed them. And the, the key to it is, is time and a bit of space and a bit of movement in a debate. And I, the arrival of the sofa, I rather scathing about sofa interviews. I don't know whether you saw Rishi Sunak the other day, his first interview as prime minister is not given in the sort of austere setting of a political interview of half an hour. He comes and sits on the sofa in, you know, in, a, in a morning television show and chats about Jilly Cooper novels that he likes. And this is a pernicious, a pernicious streak in politics, which began with Alistair Campbell, in my view, and Tony Blair. Because Alistair Campbell sussed out that there's no need to go to all the trouble of a major political interview. That doesn't reach the people you want to reach. And what's more, we don't want people saying different things, so we'll all say the same thing. So every morning you get a message of what you're allowed to say and what you should say. This is the Labour Party line and all the rest of it. And it was a, and it was a, very, effective, a very effective technique. But what it's done, in, in my view, what it's done is to um, diminish political dialogue. He sussed out, and of course now with knobs on with social media, he sussed out that you didn't actually have to answer all these complicated questions. You didn't actually have to defend yourself against impertinent television interviews. You could just go on the sofa and it would be an easy chat, it would have a different feel to it. I mean, the man who actually invented that was David Frost. And I, I remember being very cross when politicians started going to David Frost's sofa instead of coming to, I was doing a political program at the time, I can't remember what it was. Uh, and then Frost, of course, did have a technique. Uh, and and it, did, it did uncover stuff, it did, he did get somewhere, but not using the methods that I had learnt and that Robin Day and um, Brian Walden had sort of so brilliantly demonstrated. And, and, and interestingly, politicians would say about being on the sofa with Frost, ah, he lulls you into a kind of insecure, insecure, into security, and then you say things that you didn't mean to say. I'm not sure that's true. But the sofa, I think, is a danger. And I think that the way in which number 10 handles interviewing now is pernicious. After the last budget, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, instead of giving a big interview about his plans, sat in an office at a desk and interviewers came in like the infantry you know, one after the other, five minutes each. You can't do anything in a five-minute interview. You can't get anywhere in a five-minute interview. But it's the technique that favors, on the whole, favors uh, the politician. Not always. You may remember when Liz Truss was briefly our leader. She avoided a long interview. And instead, she decided to speak to what she thought would be an easy ride, local radio. It was brilliant. I think there were six local radio reporters. They were given 10 minutes each. And boy, did they lay into her, because they had nothing to lose. They weren't you know, working at Westminster, needed to be friends with her. They were given the chance of a lifetime. And they just hit, hit, hit. I, I don't know whether she ever blushes, but I should imagine she came out blushing from that. The other thing I think that is a dangerous route, which I think has now on the whole been abandoned, is the idea that a substitute for the long form interviewing of politicians is all the other stuff that happens around elections, like the debates. I think the debates are a no-go area myself. I did the first one with um, Brown and who would it have been? Nick, 
Clegg, yes, and David Cameron. The one, you know, uh, uh, we agree with Nick stuff. And they, to, to, to conduct these so-called penetrating discussions with politicians, there were 30 pages of rules. You weren't allowed as the presenter to ask any supplementary questions, only to clarify. And I did try to clarify at one point, and the moment I did it, a voice in my ear said, Labour Party have complained. That wasn't a clarification, that was a further question. Sorry. Go on. I don't think that works. And um, I think there's one form that does work, where the interviewer has to give way, and that's when the public directly questions politicians. I love those. We did, we did them on question time at elections, when um, you have an audience who just speak their mind, and the politician just has to take it. And it, that, can be, that can be a very effective format. Because, you know, in the end, that's back to the Victorian business of standing in a, well, standing in a cathedral and taking questions, or standing in a market square and being shouted at. When you have a question time audience, or any audience that just asks the things they want to ask, that is another good technique. And again, it's under threat. I remember talking about this at, at a seminar at Nuffield College, Oxford, and um, Douglas Hurd was there. And he listened thoughtfully to the end, and then at the end he said, well, that's all very well, but what if they don't ask the right question? I said, uh, it's their question. It's their question. It's the public's question. I mean, I have a kind of sympathy. I do have a kind of sympathy for, well, I have a great deal of sympathy, actually, for, for senior politicians. I think it is an unbelievably difficult job. I was reading the other day a bit of Charles Moore's biography of Margaret Thatcher. And when you see the battle she goes through, not with the opposition, they don't matter at all, within her own party, the battles you have to fight in your own party and in cabinet, and then suddenly some interviewer comes and challenges you about what you're doing. It's obviously, it's very testing and it's difficult and it's troublesome. But nevertheless, I think it's something, even though it's difficult, that, sh that should be done, that politicians should be done. I think in the interests of democracy, this long form of interviewing should be revived. At the last election, uh, Andrew Neil, you may remember, did interviews and he, um, is a good interviewer, in my view. He's a worthy successor of Robin Day and Brian Walden. And the senior politicians all accepted bar one, which was Boris Johnson. And um, Neil said, turned to camera, didn't have Johnson there, turned to camera and said, we can't compel politicians to be interviewed. We do them on your behalf. And this is the key thing, to scrutinize and hold to account those who would govern us. That is democracy, it's not too late for him to come. And then he went on, perhaps rather unwisely, the theme running through our question is trust, and why, at so many times in his career, critics and even those close to him have deemed him to be untrustworthy. Well, perhaps not surprising, having revealed those questions, Johnson didn't turn up. But the, 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 the need for that to happen and the need for the broadcasters to make it happen. At the moment, they pull back. They say, oh, nobody will listen. Nobody will listen if you have a half-hour interview. Andrew Neil, who's going to watch? You've got to get the young to watch more television. All that stuff is boring. I actually believe that if they opened it up and created vehicles for it again, like the health secretary with the nurses, which we used to do, it used to be normal. The education secretary with the teachers, why not? The prime minister with an audience just questioning him, why not? And it seems to me it's for an organization like the BBC, which is paid for by you, to create that theater. And if people won't come to it, well then the message is clear, they're frightened of you the voters. But there's nothing for them really to fear. 
They, they get maybe told by their advisors, by their you know, young spads or whatever, oh, there's nothing in it. To go. Actually, there's something in it for them because it's something for democracy. It's to do with why we vote. It's the most important part of democracy, that the politician should be available. Whether it will happen, I don't know. We do know there's an interest in politics. Amazingly, Rory Stewart and Alistair Campbell filled the Albert Hall the other week with people just come to hear them chatter about politics. So the BBC and others can't say there's no interest in politics. I'm not talking about social media, where of course there's a lot of political talk and some of it full of bile and hate. I'm talking about podcasts and I'm talking about the role the BBC should play. And I think we're falling down on the job. Thank you. Really good. some venues, they would time the applause. I think that was what's known as sustained applause. <laughs> well done, you. Fascinating. I've got a few questions I want to ask. I know you will have questions or comments you'd like to make to, as it were, have a conversation with David. But we have two commentators here, uh, one of whom was a political animal in the sense that he worked for, helped well, he was there to help people like Margaret Thatcher and later John Major. Uh, and knows a lot of politicians, has been one, is one in the House of Lords, and Carolyn, who has probably interviewed almost as many people as David over the years. Not quite. Well, Not quite. Well. Although, what you were saying about uh, Tony Blair and the change in attitude towards journalism, I mean, Tony Blair, Alistair Campbell, they knew they wanted to use the media at the start, didn't they? And the, the message discipline was so strong under that particular grouping. Um, but as things went on, do you remember towards the end of the, the Blair regime when he was coming to his end of days, he accused the press of hunting in a pack. We were feral dogs. I mean, we, my husband and I in the lobby, we wore badges proudly saying we're feral dogs of the media. Um, and there was a, a, a real sense. He also went out and he realized that there was a value in facing up to the, the public, the masochism strategy. So it's interesting, isn't it? They started off feeling they had control, but the control changes, the attitude changes, the, the relationship changed. I remember he, he, we had him on a question time by himself in the early days, and he was, he was very good. I mean, he took it, you know, he took everything until a missile was hurled at him from the back of the hall. And, and it came, thump, and it landed at my feet. And it was a BBC ham sandwich <laughs> that split in yes. Absolutely deadly, no doubt. Michael, give us the politician's <laughs> perspective on this. But the politician's perspective, I think, has changed because I go back, I cut my teeth with, with Margaret Thatcher, as, as David well remembers. And the one great thing about Margaret Thatcher is that she knew what she wanted, uh, by and large, and she wanted to express that. She wanted to convince people of it and therefore she welcomed the sort of interview that you're talking about. Nowadays in the social media world which you have mentioned which I think has been utterly pernicious and is a true danger if we don't uh, get the balance right. Nowadays it's all slogans. Your political philosophy, the whole world can be solved with a slogan on a t-shirt nowadays. Um, and what is the effect on politicians has been as the media, the social media, has become more and more aggressive, they have become more and more defensive. They have built up their defenses before you go into an interview, not discussing what it is you want to get across, not the ideas that you have, not the people that you want to convince, but not to make a mistake. So the briefing you get before you go in is not to do this, not to do that. What they don't say is what you should be doing, and that's the problem with far too many politicians nowadays, is they don't know what it is they want to do once they get there. And that is where I think that we ought to be probing the BBC. You said the BBC is falling down on the job. 
I think that you're absolutely right. There is a much bigger, better role for it in probing a way to find out what politicians actually believe. But, but, but Michael, I, t I take the point, but you, ca you can't seriously reach the top of politics without having some idea of what you want to do. I mean, are you saying Rishi Sunak has no clue what to do? He's just no, no. desperate to, what? My desperate leader, to win my, the next election. My leader is my leader, and that as a loyal... That's a very dangerous <laughs> remark. <laughs> no, um, but, but look, what, what have we got in this country? Now, it's not just politics, it's not just parliament. Every, since we've had this freedom, this freedom of social media, the right to ask any sort of question you want, uh, the freedom has done nothing but damage. But what institution in Britain nowadays is stronger than it was 20 years ago? Not Parliament, absolutely not. Not the civil service, not the church, not the courts, not the police, not our universities. What are we doing in this freedom which turns out, you mentioned those local journalists in front of Liz Trust, hit, hit, hit. They're not interested in the answers, they are interested in the questions and the gotcha moment. Far too much of that nowadays, and I think that's a, a, it's now, absolutely no, pernicious. You're conflating two things. I mean, I agree with you about the, the interviews that are short and where gotcha is what the editor wants. And it, it's true, I mean, interviews on the Today programme which only run for five minutes, it's incredibly difficult. They want to get something out, and Karen will know this, you want to get something out, you've got to do something. And you're against the time, and they're yes. famous filibusters like Boris Johnson, who know that they can know how run. to filibuster. Yeah. But, but you can't, de you can't uh, uh, deduce from that that the politicians, people go into politics, no longer have any idea, no principle, no pattern, no view about the economy, the NHS, education, the debt. That's what you seem to be saying, that they just get there and then they think, oh my God, what do we do here? No, Mr. Dimbleby, that is not what I'm saying, <laughs> as I might have said. Um, no, what I'm saying is that the, um, the media has changed. You mentioned social media and I think that what, what is happening is that editors, I'd love to hear your view, Carolyn, about how editorial standards have changed, what editors want have shifted over the last 20 years, because I suspect it's become far more competitive. I want to make my name in the business, and I'm much more interested in my personal position and the position of my organization than I am in actually doing the job of holding government to account, which is utterly responsible, absolutely vital. But where does it happen nowadays? What do the editors want you to produce? Well, look, the problem is that there are a whole variety of platforms now. On a straightforward interview, I mean, something like the Westminster Hour, which was much more of a, a late-night conversation program where you hope to bring the human side out of the politician and hopefully get them to divulge something interesting. I think that's a much more straightforward idea when it comes to a Today programme or a PM programme interview. Obviously, you're looking for a line. There's, there's some controversial topic around at the moment. You've got to do your research and work out how you're going to try and lure that politician into actually answering your question. And the difficulty these days is that so many of the politicians follow the line. They, they have a line that they're given. I mean, it happened. It happened with previous governments. Of course it has. It happened with Labour. It's happened with the Conservatives. But it does make it incredibly difficult when a politician will come on and say what they want to say, whatever, regardless of, of the question. But have you, know, you given the game away by using the phrase, lure them in? <laughs> what you're wanting to do is lure them in to make an error. If you are a politician, you've learned that a divided party is in trouble. Therefore, the real idea is everyone's got to be consistent. It's not a mistake. So you it's, are given it's... your line to take, and you don't want to get it wrong. Well, it's hopefully eliciting information. Uh, we are there asking the questions that the public want answered. You have a prominent politician. There is an issue that's in the news at the moment. You'd like to hear that politician at least try to address it in as honest a way as they could be. I mean, some of them give the impression of giving you honest answers, um, sometimes not. I mean, they, the trouble for modern politicians, I think, is that 
they are so worried about their words being sliced and diced and, and, and taken out of context because of the demise of the long form interview that runs like that. They will appear on the Today programme, they'll do an interview, and they know that the moment they slip up or the moment that they say something slightly off key, that's going to be the clip. Would you apply uh, that to the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Home Secretary, that they go in and answer questions from you, terrified they're going to slip up? Well, I mean, in that case, they're not fit to be holding those positions. No, but, it, but it, you know, it, it, well, you know, you know more from your Last your year, side I think we had, we had five chancellors in four weeks or something like yeah. that, so I'm not surprised that many of them feel rather afraid for their jobs. It, um, it hasn't been a classic era the last couple of years for British politics, mm. I think, has it? That's not my I point. think David is right on this, and my experience is that the people who are the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, the Chancellor, actually are re usually completely on top of their material. The Prime Minister particularly, because each Wednesday he or she is going through a lot of material prior to Prime Minister's question time. So on the whole, I think they will be less fearful. May, may, I, I, may I mention one opportunity, though, to talk about how the long-form interview demonstrated that in the case of one particular Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, that his grasp of detail was minimal, shall we say. Do you remember the Andrew Neil interview where he asked Boris Johnson in the run-up to, the, the, to Brexit um, about GATT, about the trade negotiations? And Boris Johnson had obviously prepared for the interview. He knew that Andrew Neil did his preparation and he will have worked out lots of, of tricky areas. And Boris Johnson knew about paragraph B of the GATT treaty and he talked about that. Andrew Neil had led him down the road to, to talking about paragraph B. And then Andrew Neil said to him, well, what about paragraph C, Prime Minister? Uh, uh, Boris Johnson sort of waffled for a bit. And then Andrew Neil said, do you know what's in paragraph C? And Boris Johnson had to say, well, no. Um, uh, but you wouldn't have got that necessarily in a shorter interview. You know, you got it in a long you form have got interview. Ted Heath <laughs> I mean, Ted Heath knew every. When I did that thing I mentioned at the very beginning, um, negotiating with the common market, I mean, he was the master of detail. I never did a long interview with him, and I don't think I ever saw any long interviews with him. But I'm sure they were absolutely, you know, he would not be bullied or put off or, or, or caught by somebody trying to you know, make him say something he didn't want to say. He, he knew what he wanted to say. He would have had a lot of time on the sofa either, would he? He would not <laughs> have had any time. <laughs> Imagine him on the sofa. <laughs> yes. Can I, can I yes. just follow up on what, what Karen has just said? I and mean, there's a very practical example of where I feel that the media, the broadcast media, all the media, didn't do their job. It was during lockdown. It was during COVID. I mean, this is a, something that will, have, will knock this country back for 20 years before we get through it. And yet the questioning of those who were responsible for it uh, was, they allowed themselves to be restricted to press conferences which were tightly controlled with the Prime Minister and two uh, scientists either side, and we we're going to follow the science. And it's become quite clear that they had no idea, first of all, what the science meant. And there is no such thing as the science anyway. And we are we're going through an inquiry right now to find out uh, what it is that uh, we got right and what it is we got wrong. It will take years, and it seems to me that, uh, that we allowed, the, we walked blindly and deftly into a COVID crisis with lockdowns, which many Sorry, people were trying to say is wrong. The media or, or the, or the pol political reaction to it. I, and maybe the WhatsApp messages that we may or may not get to read will show a, a state of total chaos, like you described, but that's it, not with the media, is it? That was the political response, uh, was but inadequate. The, but what I'm saying is that the media failed to put enough pressure. They followed the government's line in allowing them to be talked well, to. Now we go over to number 10 for a statement yes. from the Prime Minister, yes. that stuff. Yes, and this is a huge, huge issue. It, it will have changed society in many ways, and we never tried to get to grips with it. Now we are trying to get to grips with it, but it's too late. But is that, was that true during COVID? Were you, were you forced to 
No, I don't. Align or not ask, not I don't question think so. The scientists? Well, because at the start, none of us knew what we were dealing with, did we? Um, so we were, we were all being bamboozled. We didn't know what was happening. Um, we were trying to, to get facts together to know what the real situation was. I mean, as time went on, we did give a lot of airtime to people who were critical and who were saying the lockdowns were wrong. I mean, I had Graham Brady telling me that it was like a totalitarian state what was happening. So, so, you know, we were airing the other views, but in the, in the early days, it was very difficult. Well, you, 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 you forgive me, but I'm not sure that the, the media got the balance right. There were many people who were trying to question, scientists trying to, as well as politicians, trying to question the, the philosophy, the government philosophy at the time, and found it very difficult to get to their views expressed, not just the fault of the media. I mean, there was, a, there was a virologist at Oxford University who said, look, the lockdown is the wrong response for it. She ended up having to go round campus with a bodyguard because she stirred up things which people didn't want to hear. If we come back to the, the issue about the relationship between the politician, the press and broadcasters, um, is it over? I mean, can it be resolved? Are we now doomed to have the trivialization of politics through social media as the main way in which, if you're a politician, you have to get your voice heard? I, I hope not, because uh, I do believe that democracy is in real trouble. And you look at it globally. I mean, one of the greatest moments of my life was when the Berlin Wall came down. It looked, as in, it looked as if the West had won, not without a war, but because people wanted to share what we had, our economic goods, yes, but also our values. It was the most brilliant point in history, and people used to write that it was the end of history. Now, 30 years later, people spit on the West around the world. We've forgotten to fight for the things. We've forgotten to realize that democracy is not free. There's a price to be paid. You have to work for it very hard. And the sinew of democracy, and I think this perhaps brings together the, the, the media and the political establishment, the sinews of democracy isn't free speech, because free speech, complete free speech as we have right now is, is chaos. It's responsibility, it's tolerance, it's accepting that the other side, if you disagree with them, actually has a right to their opinion, even if you vigorously disagree with them. That is gradually being squeezed out the window. In America, you find it has ruined the system. You have a two blocks at war with each other. No tolerance, no respect, just noise and, 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 and shouting at each other. That all those people, uh, the Trump supporters, for instance, I imagine you're thinking about, rather than Biden's, uh, they are convinced that they've been let down by the system, that their lives have they've been impoverished, that they don't have a say. It's not, it's not that people have just turned their back on it, it's that they feel that democracy hasn't actually delivered what was being promised by democracy. And then the difference between, you know, the, the, the 60s and 70s and 80s, even though people disagreed deeply with, with what um, Thatcherism was about, for instance, they disagreed with the Iraq war, but they didn't sort of feel the politicians uh, can do nothing about this. The reason they were so powerful in their attacks on politicians was they believed they could do something about it. My fear now is that in the state we're in now, post-Brexit, with the impoverishment we see around us, that people start to feel that no politician can do anything about it. And that's a really dangerous place to get to. Can, can I ask you, Michael, what, what you think about serving politicians being interviewers themselves and fronting political interview programmes as happens now? Indeed, I think of Ed Balls, who is the host of um, Good Morning Britain. That's, that's right. And um, obviously, you've got Jacob Rees-Mogg on, well, I, on I, his own I, evening show. Carolyn, there was a time, and I too was a, a, a TV interviewer. I used to present a program called Dispatch Box at 11.30 at night, uh, live. I, well, my job was to send the nation to sleep, and I believe that I, uh, I, I did that very effectively, but I discovered that the competition <laughs> was just was too much. Um, it, it's, it's different now, I, I think. 
think that the, the formats are different now, aren't they? The, for, the formats are very different. But, I, but I, I come back and I actually agree with so much of what uh, David has says that the, the, the system, the, the BBC after all is meant to set an example, not simply to follow. You kind of sense nowadays that the BBC is following, it's following other people, it's, it's trying to keep up with, with, with new fashions instead of actually getting back to the core job of, and, and remembering that part of its core job is to actually hold politicians to account in a responsible and reasonable way. Not the gotcha way that you so often get, for instance, uh, where, where BBC interviews, and they're not interested in the, the answer to the question because they constantly interrupt. And politicians come out of... You interrupt sometimes. Sorry to interrupt you, yeah. I yeah. say yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to interrupt when yeah. people are going on. Yeah. Uh, and and the, then they know that you're running out of time and, and they will purposely try to, to as I've said, filibuster. Um, you, you can be persistent and you can be polite. And I think there are still programs that are doing that. I, I feel, you know, we're, we're, we're not at the end of times here. I think there are really good interviewers around still who are probing, who prosecute. I mean, you know, you've got great interviewers. You've got Nick and Michelle on the Today program who are really, really strong. They know their stuff. Um, they do draw people out. Then you've got the great podcasts as well. You've got people like Matt Ford. I don't know if any of you have listened to Political Party. It's a fantastic format because he sits down with a politician for about half an hour, 40 minutes, you know, even longer, and really talks to them about what drove them, what's behind the policies that they talked about. I heard him with uh, David Blunkett just the other day. It was superb. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't feel as depressed as you two. Yeah. But hang on a second, like you because are. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> Matt Ford's terrific and the podcasts are good. The Today program, you don't get there the time to do what Michael is talking about, what I was talking yeah. about. I mean, it seems to be more and more compressed. Was it? I mean, and it's it irksome it? for the interviewer because, of course, given only seven minutes, I mean, you think it was always well, the like that. Well, the 8 interview yeah. can go for about 20 minutes, yes. can't it? And it does. Right. You know, there are times when it, when it needs it, it will stretch. And the editor can, if, if they hear that an interview is going really well or that something is happening, they will let it run. But then you know. it needs senior politicians to turn up to do it. And well, yeah. Mr. Campbell began the thing saying, oh, don't let yeah. him go. We'll send a junior in and you get some whippersnapper who's only just, you know, become an Who just reads the line. Uh, reads, reads the brief, that's right, yeah. and is then asked about some major political issue in the United States or China or whatever, in Iraq, and, and, and has to give an answer, which you know is just rubbish, because they're not, it's not, their, <laughs> not their job, you know, they're not even thought about it. Well, I rather like interviewing, oh, sorry, used to like interviewing, I don't do it anymore, um, the, the politician who'd made their mark, and they'd been at the top of their game, and there were, I don't like to say on the way down, but you know they had they didn't have as much to prove, and often they would be far more forthcoming. It's easier then, it's safer then. Yes. Yeah, 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 you know. Being on the way yeah. down is perfect. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love love being on the way let's, down. <laughs> let's make our question time moment. This is your moment, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if you have questions to put principally to David, but to our other panelists as well, this is your moment. Do we have a roving microphone and nimble people running up and down the nave with it? If you've got something you'd like to say, or a question you'd like to ask, let's take two or three, and then we can have a cumulative answer. Uh, if you, yes, please, we'll come first to you. Tell us who you are, uh, and if you've got anything interesting about your association. My name's Malcolm Allison. Uh, I wonder, what, in journalistic terms, do you think that Piers Morgan is a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think you brought this right down to the level at which we hoped it wasn't going to be, but never mind. <laughs> Uh, my answer would be, who is Piers Morgan? But, <laughs> since you've asked the question, we'll, we'll take a couple more and then I think we'll have a cumulative answer. Anyone else got a question? Yes, further back. At the back, that, that's behind you. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to. I shall be now harassed for told I was bullying. I didn't mean to, it was meant in a jocular um, way. Uh, hi, I'm um, Tell Chris. us who you are and what your question uh, is. I'm Chris. Oh, dear. Uh, up here, um, yeah, you were saying that um, the BBC managed to fill the um, Royal Albert Hall with um, what is it, Rory Stewart's podcast, 
And um, I was thinking, they used to have a lot more political programming on um, BBC Parliament, like, um, like Peter Snow doing um, the Harold Wilson night um, some years ago, and was it Steve Richards doing um, retrospective on politicians? But the, um, the funding, I think, the BBC Parliament's um, fallen. I think it's a real shame. It's, um, do you think we'll um, see um, the that we'll see more funding for um, BBC Parliament, or do you think with the current thing, uh, the current um, situation, it's going to be uh, have to be in um, different means? I think I think we got the gist of that. Uh, the Royal Albert Hall, I don't think it was a BBC venture. It was a it was a commercial venture done by the podcast. Rory Stewart, of course, no longer a politician, hoped to be the mayor. Didn't realise there wasn't enough support for him. Alistair Campbell has never been a politician, though he's known a lot of people. But people enjoy the discussion. David, are you optimistic about the BBC? Are you hopeful? Is that what the question was? No, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to give a spin to the question that will make it... What was the question? It, it, the question, the essential the that... question is, will the BBC be able to fund quality political programming in the future, given there is an audience for it, as the Albert Hall thing demonstrates? Well, how am I to know? I mean, I would like it to be. I think the license fee is unsupportably unfair, particularly in a country that's getting poorer, to ask £159 from families living on the 17th floor of an apartment block in Sheffield who never watch the BBC, but find the money to watch Netflix or whatever, to insist on £159 or face criminal charges I think is no longer sustainable in any way and a different way has to be found of funding the BBC and I believe a different way will be found. One way is to attach it more to the value of property but as we know and Michael Dobbs will fill you in on this everybody's terrified of a rate revaluation so property values doesn't, doesn't actually work. Um, but for the BBC not to exist and I'm not being I don't have a sort of view that the BBC is uniquely good at doing any of this, except for one thing, that I think the BBC in the world at large is a really, really important part of British culture and of what Britain still has to offer the world. And if you are, I've just been by chance in Sudan uh, before the, a month before the troubles broke, I know that in Omdurman and in Khartoum, people are listening not to Voice of America, not to Moscow Radio, not to their local radio, not to the voice of Addis Ababa, but they listen to the BBC because they trust it. And I think that is something in a, in a country that is diminished and diminishing, it seems to me, that that is still something we should hold on to through the BBC. The fact that the BBC is a trusted voice not trusted in this country, everybody lays into us here, but abroad is trusted. And the BBC, interestingly now, expanding into the United States where it knows there's an audience against the American networks, against Fox and CNN, Fox on the right and CNN now seen as too liberal, that the BBC knows there is a voice. So that, you know, the idea of objectivity, the idea of dispassionate broadcasting, I think is the most, most valuable thing that broadcasting offers. And it's always under attack in this country, and it's understandable. You know, you ask questions that seem to be hostile, and people think you belong, you know, to the, you attack the Labour Party, you're thought to be a Tory, you attack the Tory Party, you're thought to be Labour, and that is the normal forum of debate. But actually, I think the heart of the BBC, when it has the courage to stick its whatever it is to the whatever it is, is that standard of objectivity and the belief in it. And I think the overseas service is the thing that really has to be defended. And no, I don't think it will disappear, but I think it'll, it's got a... There is that commercial arm as well. Yes. I, I, I couldn't agree with David more, because when I've gone around the world and talked to my friends around the world, particularly at times of crisis, the BBC becomes one of the great supports that they cannot find elsewhere. And we have a world which is pretty much in crisis. The need for the BBC's world service is greater. 
and yet constantly it is being cut back by government as much as anybody else. I'm not trying to suggest that the politicians have got it right. It is the best form of foreign aid we can possibly give, which is reasonable objectivity, truth about what is going on in the world. And you can either have a world, you can either look at a world where the, 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 the competition, the battle that we are facing over the next 20, 30 years is going to be by force of arms, or it could be a battle competition of ideas. And this is where Britain soft power still has a role to play. It could have a role to play. And the foreign service, the foreign, uh, the world service is one of the great weapons in that battle of ideas. Can I just say, 159 pounds, I think we should spell out more what people get for it because it's not just BBC One, it's radio, it's local radio, although radio, local radio has been hacked away at. I think the priorities maybe could be changed where the cutbacks happen, but people get an awful lot for their £159. Um, I don't know what the answer is, David, about that. Uh, I don't know if there is another funding formula, but there, something's going to have to be found because this argument is continuing and, you know, the BBC and the government are, are at loggerheads and they will, you know, they'll be coming up to a moment of crisis quite soon, won't they? We'll take another question. I'd paid £159 for Bargain Hunter Loan. Uh, person there and then the person in the front. But take both questions. When we've thought of an answer to the Piers Morgan question, we'll, we will let you know. It may take some time. What was the Piers Morgan question? The Piers Morgan question is, is Piers Morgan a good thing or a bad thing? And, uh, uh, ah, a very good, a politician's answer, if I may say so, from David Dimbleby. Is he a good thing or a bad thing? David Dimbleby says he's, both. He probed and prosecuted quite a few um, high-profile politicians in his long-form interview. So he's not just, just a gotcha. Oh, very good. good. In my humble opinion. Two questions. One for the gentleman here in the, in the blue. Uh, yes, sir. My name is uh, Christopher Beasley, former member of the European Parliament. I think at the uh, Sir Edward Heath Foundation meeting, I would be forgiven for raising the subject of Europe and Britain's relations, particularly in the, hopefully, in the near future. Um, we've heard from the uh, main speech about the degradation of political debate, but it seems to me currently there is no debate in this country about our European future. Does anybody agree, and if so, what do we do about it? Good, good question. We'll, we will deal with that. The European debate, there doesn't seem to be one going on in the UK. Uh, can we do something? We'll take the other question at the same time, though, just so we've got a couple to, and one at the front as well. Yes? Uh, my name is Peter Bird. Uh, my, my question is, generals were always accused of fighting the last war, and listening to David in particular talking about the demise of the long-form interview, I think we have to accept that is the last war. What I want to ask is, what do you think, of, what is the future? Do you have any ideas that you've got in your mind that haven't yet been taken on, but you think could be new ways of holding politicians better to account in the social media age? Okay, let's take those two together. It seems that the debate about Europe has been closed down. We're not discussing it. Is that the way it's going to be? That's the first question. The second question is, what does the future hold? David. Well, the second question was, what does, what the, future does the future hold? What, what, what do you in see In terms happening? of Britain and Europe? Or is, no, first of all, the Britain. vision or what? <laughs> Our friend says the debate on Europe is shut down. No one's talking about it now. Yep. We're saying it's settled. We move on. And what he is saying is, shouldn't we be possibly reopening this? Where are the broadcasters leading in this? Well, I, I don't myself think the debate on Europe is shut down. I think that I think the whole lead up to Brexit is was a catastrophe myself. Um, I don't believe it was because, as some people say, question time put Nigel Farage on, that half the country voted to leave the EU. I believe it was something much, much, much more powerful and fundamental, which was a disillusion people had with their own lives. What we saw when uh, the seats fell afterwards in the Red Wall, that people 
were no longer accepting what they were told about their lives and that there are many people who feel that the society they live in doesn't suit them, that they, that it doesn't seem to serve them anymore, the NHS, education, the road system, the rail system, everywhere you look this country seems to me to be falling apart uh, and I think the, 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 the easy answer was somehow got across by a meretricious arguments by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others that leave the EU and somehow we can sort all these things out. My view is we've left the EU and it's made things worse in trade terms quite clearly. If you talk to anybody, I mean, talk to people who sell in Europe and they're selling less. Uh, the, 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 the answer at the moment is a catastrophe. And it may be 10 or 20 years, as Michael says, before this thing is sorted out. Um, but I, and, I, and I think the, the BBC had a funny reaction at the beginning. It was, but they do, I tell you, I tell you a, a slightly different story, but it does show how the BBC operates in its corporate mind. When Tony Blair won the election with a landslide in 1997, the editor of the political wing of the BBC television thing sent a memo round to all of us saying the debate must now change. We must no longer challenge government because he's won a huge majority. We must simply examine the way he carries out the things that he has offered. In other words, off the table, is the relationship between, you know, whatever it was Blair was arguing about, capitalism and, I don't know. Anyway, because he'd won an election, we mustn't talk about it as though it was still an issue. And I've taken the editor of this to task on, on, a, on a television program, and he admits it was a terrible mistake, and he withdrew it. But that was the instinct of kind of, uh, maybe we, the BBC, are too you know, too full of ourselves. We thought we knew how it was going to go and we got it wrong. We'd better shut down the debate. And I think post-Brexit, that was one of the really dangerous things that happened. And even now, you know, you don't get... I haven't seen a debate. Was the Brexit vote? Is it, are we better off outside the EU than we would have been if we hadn't left? You don't see it because they feel we were a bit out of touch perhaps on that. We didn't expect it to go that way, they think to themselves. I don't, I didn't have a clue which way it would go. But, but as a corporation, they think, you know, the, the conoscente thought, like David Cameron stupidly thought that it was all done and dusted. So when they find they're wrong footed, they turn to back off. So my, my, I agree with you that the debate must be opened. And it should be examined, and we should have debates about, you know, where it's going and how, how you know, what, what, what the hell's going on. Michael, chip in. Well, I, 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 having agreed with you so profoundly over many issues, I completely disagree with you. On your, um, I, I, I work for Brexit. I believed in Brexit. I look around Europe right now, and I think, I look at the riots in France. I look at the political chaos in Germany. I look what's happening in places like Hungary, Spain, and I said, let's put this in context. Nowhere has it easy. And this idea that we could click our fingers and everything would change, a criticism which was made validly, I think, about many Brexiteers who said, look, there's a simple answer to all this, Brexit. There are no simple answers anymore. Um, we have to find our own way in the world, and Brexit gives us an opportunity, but it's a part of an ongoing program. Should the BBC be leading the debate about our future in Europe? It shouldn't need to, because that should always be. Uh, so, not just Europe, but the rest of the world. What are we about? Who are our friends? What do we do about China, for instance, and Russia? It's all part and parcel of a view about where we should be, where we want to be uh, in, in 20 years' time. Um, and it shouldn't be up to the BBC to lead those debates. It should be up to the BBC to make platforms available to all sides so that that debate could be pursued. Do you want to add something, Carol? Well, I'm not out of rehab yet. I've only, I, I, I'm still addicted to not expressing my opinion, especially about Brexit. After those very, very turbulent years where we tried to do balance and fair reporting and got criticised, whatever we did, 
Um, I'm going to stay out of this one for now. Maybe give me another few months and I might be ready to express my opinions. But I think maybe we get a podcast with David Dimbleby and Michael Dobbs. A, a, a weekly podcast where they discuss the latest moves well, in the post-Brexit world. What do you think? The Royal Albert Hall exactly. is next. We've got Alistair time for and Rory of our time. Two quick final questions so that we can end on a buoyant and positive and optimistic note. <laughs> yes, clearly. Yes. Yes, thank you. Roy, Roy Perry, another former member of the European Parliament, one of the forgotten tribe. Uh, we obviously have uh, good interviewers coming forward still with the BBC and other broadcasters. Are we satisfied that we're getting a good calibre of politicians coming forward? If not, what can we do about it? Very good. The question was, maybe, the, maybe we should end on that. I don't know. Well, let's hear the other one to give everyone a chance. What was the other question down there? Yes, person down there. Thank you. My name is Adam Ridley, and I've worked variously for Mr. Heath, Mrs. Thatcher, Geoffrey Howe, Nigel Lawson, and various other members of the Conservative Party and administrations. I'd like to ask a question about the COVID discussion we heard earlier. Michael Dobbs said, and I had a lot of sympathy with it, that he didn't think that the world of public opinion and the media had distinguished itself, and the much of the difficulty that we encountered reflected a failure of the media in some sense. Caroline Quinn implied that it had been a jolly difficult job. We didn't know very much about it all, at least at the beginning. We out there in the real world were shit scared, listening to every bulletin, reading every piece of newspaper, morning, noon, and night. And if we were saved at the end in our personal state of concern, it was because of the arrival of the vaccines and the effective public health. Now, one may well be faced with another round of pandemic at any time. So my question is for David Dimbleby. Does he share the criticisms that Michael and Carolyn offered? And would he be any happier if we had another pandemic in the near future? OK, two questions. I'm going to actually ask David to answer last, because I think we should give our special guest the last word. But did you follow both of those questions? Yes, yes indeed. I'm looking forward to having um, lunch with my old friend Adam uh, in two days' time, actually. We go back a long way, and we, we, we have a debate. We, we have different perspectives on many things, but we have a very healthy debate. And debate and discussion and learning from each other is what we miss so much in the political dialogue of today. Are but, people of caliber coming into politics? This um, is the first question. The first question, the sad answer is no, because I believe that the job of an MP, uh, not necessarily that of a prime minister or a minister, but the job of a basic MP, which is there to keep the system healthy, has become far more difficult over the last 20 years. It's changed, it's become more intensive, much less time to be able to step back and think about things in the round, rather than just simply deal with this demand and that demand, which is constant. But can I, can mm -hmm. I just offer one, you asked for a note of hope. Yes. It's something I said to David Cameron when he was prime minister, do you realize that every prime minister that we have with one or two very few exceptions, every single prime minister ends up getting chopped, hacked, stabbed to death, dragged out of number 10 with their fingernails left in the carpet of number 10. That is what democracy is about. It's refreshing the system. And yes, Rishi Sunak will have his day. The follow-on will have his day, just as the last three prime ministers last year also had, had their day. It's, um, it's still, I'm, I'm worried about democracy, yes, but it's still a far better system than almost any system that's been developed elsewhere. Well done. Do you, do you think Karen. then that the cycle has moved, that it's inevitable now that Rishi Sunak can't win the election? No, has no, has, no, has no, the no. time, that's has not what I'm saying. the natural time? <laughs> he might win several elections, but in the end. <laughs> but in the end. Anything to add to that? Um, well, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, the, the uh, uh, getting good calibre um, candidates, it's difficult because of what you say, the, the, the analysis, the scrutiny, the abuse that 
politicians face now, the instant reactions on social media, you've got to have skin of a rhino. And yet, when you look at all the selection panels for all the parties, still seem to be lots and lots of people who go for it. So maybe there just needs to be a, a better weeding out process um, rather Good. than letting people We're coming go. to you now, David. I, I, I was lucky enough to know Robin Day. First met him when I was a student. And I later knew him because one of his late children was at school with our children. And chatting to him always in the street, he always gave the impression that he felt a little disappointed in his life, that he'd ended up just asking the questions and that he clearly had wanted to be a politician. Indeed, he tried to be a politician and was disappointed that he'd been making a bit of a noise and asking difficult questions instead of doing things and making a difference. Has that ever been your feeling? Are you, you pleased that you spent your life, or much of it, asking questions? I, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that I've spent my life asking questions. And I see asking questions as part of the democratic process, to be pompous about it, just as much as trying to win a seat. Uh, and my political views have always been, they've, they go, you know, around, well, actually, like any politician, like Michael, you know, he doesn't know where he's coming from half the time. He goes this way, that way, then another way. And, you know, and I, I mean, that's the, that's the business of politics. I mean, who actually does know what's good for this country and how it should be done. Only a complete idiot would say they really knew. Maybe Nigel Farage really knows, but I don't think anybody else does. So, uh, no, I've, I, I've, I actually love and have always loved, I'm going to say the sound of my own voice. What I mean is, <laughs> what I mean is I've always loved broadcasting. I find the business of broadcasting, not just interviewing, but chairing things and doing commentary. I just find it totally absorbing. And I'm luckily still doing it. So I'm, uh, no, I've never ever want, not for a moment thought of becoming a politician. And do you think that the caliber of people coming into politics, as was implied in one of the questions, is not quite what it was? Or is it just us looking back and thinking, ah, the big beasts were yesterday? I think that's the, that's the danger, of course, because I was brought up in the post Second World War political um, era when everybody, I mean, I remember in the what, late in the 70s, people had, you know, they'd fought at Monte Cassino or they'd been on the front line and uh, they'd fought in, in the Far East. They had, and uh, uh, Ted Heath, after all, had a military, had military experience. And, f and it was thought by people that this made them men and women with kind of, with a kind of experience of the world. I'm not actually convinced that that, and anyway, it's impossible now. You can't, you know, you can't sort of reinvent those kind of people. Uh, the world is different. The people who go into politics now, and I know some trying to get in, I know one person in particular trying to get a seat in the Conservative Party. And she's on a list of, I think it's 5,000 people. Gosh. Would that be right? On a list of candidates mm -hmm. that have been vetted by the Conservative Party. So there's no shortage of people coming through. And we know the challenges they face are really tough on their families, through social media, on the insults, on the threats. We've had two MPs murdered. It's not an easy life. And it's not a kind of, and, it, and it's been diminished actually by social media and constant insult. Uh, and constant sort of derision. So I think it's a tough life to go in for, but I, no, I do believe that good politicians, and I think there are some around now in the House of Commons, that, they, that you know, we can't just give up and say, oh, well, it was better when I was 40, you know. I don't think that's right. And if it is right, we all have a duty to try and encourage people to go into politics, yeah. Yeah. local politics, national politics, Go and try it if you have an instinct for it. I don't have the instinct, but if you do have the instinct, you should. So we have. I admire politicians because they do put themselves in the line of fire. I wouldn't want to do that job, but there are really good politicians around, you know, great backstories, different backstories. I mean, just 
think of one, West Streeting, for instance, you know, Labour, health, shadow health spokesman, amazing backstory, has, has brought himself up from, you know, really difficult background. And there are plenty of stories like that. And we've got far more people now in Parliament who had real jobs, not just you know, they were spads or they worked in the political system. You know, teachers, doctors, people who've lived a real life outside. So I think maybe we're a bit, you yeah. know, rosy tinted glasses about the past. I don't know. It's good and bad in each. I'm rosy tinted about the future because it is time <laughs> for tea, ladies and gentlemen, which is exciting. Uh, there is hope for the future. You mentioned the young woman who you know is on that long list. I have a daughter who is also on that long candidates list. In fact, she stood at the last general election against the now the leader of the Liberal Democrats and I was handing out leaflets for her and I knocked on a door and a, a Saturday afternoon the man answered of course still wearing his pajamas and um, I um, thrust the leaflet at him and I said would you please vote for my daughter and he said rather aggressively what's she got to offer then and I said I thought rather well and quite quickly I said integrity and intelligence he peered at me and said are you sure she's your daughter? <laughs> For our vote of thanks, please welcome Sarah Morrison. Sorry, I'm stopped laughing, I must know. To those of you who are regular attendees, I apologise that the usually unerring Arundel team have yet again ordered the most ancient of their devotees to voice the thank yous for this year's treat. So I'm their fault, not my fault. So denying me the pleasure of wallowing, unbothered that any words are inadequate appreciations for this talent-ridden platform. The Dimbledon dynasty, brilliantly upheld by David, is a hunk of UK history on its own, as many of us were well aware. He and his co-occupants of this platform's wit, knowledge, experience of times past, exemplify elegant, informed, civilised exponents of professional expertise from what too often seems to be a long bygone era. My Arundel's masters forbid me wrapping thanks with personal prejudice. So more comments about some of contemporary communications avenues are superfluous, but it's comforting for a geriatric like me to realize that it's not only a geriatric's inclination to confuse woke with broke and social media with mayhem, even before we get around to future thrills like today's speakers being succeeded by AI robots. <laughs> no one can prevent the thought escaping. I mean this very seriously, actually, that it's our loss that I'm reliably informed that David declines to offer himself as a candidate for the BBC chair. Long may Miss Quinn forget that she's retired and present. Lord Dobbs, pen push onwards, I beg of you, and please note, I'm resisting the temptation to tell him where he could put his Brexit pen. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Brandis reminds us, as ever, that being released by a constituency was a social service, liberating him to remind us that humour is the wrapping without which human humanity withers or even worse. For the privilege of sharing this occasion with the, within these sacred walls, you see, we owe boundless thanks to the Dean, as always, and are so glad that he's sharing it with us. To those who make Arundel's a hub of excellence, enlightenment and enjoyment, year in, year out, Ted's gratitude would be unlimited. I'm honoured, even when I moan, to say a uh, thank you, however inadequately, to today's speakers and all responsible for these so very special occasions that we can share. Have a good tea.
I'd just like to invite you all to come and join us for a drink in the garden at Arundel's, and thank you again for coming.